Whenever I'm breaking down and packing out an animal in the field, I can already taste the grilled tenderloins and the rich, silky asabuco. But when the prime cuts are gone, most hunters like myself are left with a freezer full of ground game meat. On this Meat Eater cooking special, I'm gonna show you how to make the best of ground meat, and I'm gonna demystify the process of grinding your own burger. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. On this meat eater cooking special, we're gonna talk about ground meat or burger. I think a lot of hunters have sort of this love-hate relationship with ground meat. When you get your animal cut up, nothing feels better than having the freezer stacked with those little bars of gold, you know, those little bags of grind. But then later, when you open your freezer and all your steaks are gone and your roasts are gone, it's almost a little disappointing. And I've many times I've heard friends lament, like, I don't have anything left but ground, you know? I don't think you really need to feel that way because we're gonna talk about some things that do with ground meat, phenomenal preparations that I'm sure you'll love and your family will love. I'm grinding up meat from three different animals. I have some moose meat, from a bull that me and a buddy killed in the Burks Range of Alaska. I have some mule deer from a muley I killed in Southern Colorado. And I got some whitetail meat that was given to me by my friend Ryan Callahan, who killed a whitetail in Central Montana. You can, in the field, freeze the boned out pieces, thaw it, grind it, and then refreeze it. It works fine, okay? This meat is pretty frozen still. I like to have it frozen because it cuts nice, it grinds nice, and it's safer. Always work with everything being really cold. You should have it be that your hands kind of ache from the cold. So much of the off flavor in game meat comes from fat. So I'll trim that stuff off because that can hide and hold a lot of off flavors, and the flavors are only gonna get worse in the freezer. To grind meat, I like to cut it in a little bit less than a one inch cube. Maybe the widest dimension to be square inch. Basically like this right here. Game meat is so lean that you need to add in fat when you grind it. I'm using pork trim, which you can buy cheap from a butcher. I generally like to do 10% fat, 90% lean game meat, and keep it very cold. If the fat gets too warm, the friction in the grinder can start to render it out and your ground meat will be an oily mess. I oil the blade, the auger, and the end plate with either food grade mineral oil or silicon spray to help prevent heat from friction. I also put my grinder components, other than the motor, into my freezer for a few hours in order to make everything as cold as possible. This would be honestly perfectly acceptable, but as I kind of form a patty in my hand, it just feels a little bit lumpy to me. It could work, but it's gonna make kind of a game time decision and run it through one more time. It's almost like, how do you like your burgers done? Do you like them well done or rare? You know, it's like, do you like a fine grind or like a coarse grind? See, it looks a little different coming out the second time. The fat's well integrated. I can still see the pieces. They haven't started to melt out. Meets the perfect coarseness. This stuff's ready to use or it's ready to bag up and freeze. If you've got a ton of ground game meat in your freezer, a really efficient, tasty way to burn through it is by making meatloaf. I know some people hear the term meatloaf and it just makes you kind of want to fall asleep. It's just this sort of like boring, too comforting of a comfort food. But this meatloaf preparation we're gonna do here actually deserves like a better name than meatloaf. We're just gonna call it meatloaf. It's spectacular. It starts with sauteing some onion and olive oil. When the onion gets translucent, add in some minced garlic and cook that for a minute more. Pull half the onion and garlic out of the pan to use later and add in your spinach, red pepper flakes, and nutmeg. Cook that down until the spinach wilts. You really wanna get that onion and garlic mixed up in there. Once the spinach is nicely wilted, take it off the heat. The next step is to mix your ground game meat with the rest of the sauteed onion and garlic, a couple of eggs, salt, black pepper, and breadcrumbs. So I'll put some breadcrumb in a bowl or in milk. Mix that with your fingers. It forms sort of a paste, you can see. It feels like cold oatmeal almost. And then that all gets mixed. As you're mixing that up, 
Add in parsley, chives, minced thyme leaves, and oatmeal to round out the meat portion of the loaf. And give that a very good stir so all that stuff gets integrated well. It's kind of a messy job. Okay, at this point, all that stuff we've been adding in is really well blended. So it doesn't look like any pockets of more than one thing than another. It's still nice and cold. It feels almost like dough. The next step is take half the meatloaf mixture, and put it in a buttered loaf pan and pat it down so you get it into the corners. You, know, you don't want it to be like a really densely packed meatloaf, but you want it to be firm. This is kind of something you get by feel. The next step is to add the inside layers. The first layer is the spinach we wilted earlier. Be sure to leave some open space around the edges so that the meat can encase the inside layers. I find myself doing this kind of thing a lot because I'm always trying to find ways to slip spinach past my four-year-old. So I'll bury spinach and things all the time. Next, add a layer of cheese. You can use whatever cheese you want. Personally, I like provolone. On top of that, add some toasted and chopped pine nuts. And then add the top layer of the meat mix. Around the edge is making sure to press in and bind the top layer of the ground meat with the bottom layer of the ground meat so it forms a little seam all the way around. I like to leave a little bit of a tapered so the edges are lower than the center because this is gonna let off a lot of juice when you cook it and it gives it a place for the juice to sit around the edges. Top it with a mixture of like a very seedy good mustard mixed with honey. Then while you're doing all this, you wanna get an oven preheated to 350 degrees. And this needs to cook for an hour at 350. We'll come back to it when it's done. The next dish we're going to do has two interesting things going for it. It has an interesting name. The Italians call it something like fagatelli. The British, who mostly eat this dish, call it faggots. That word has such a different connotation you know, in our culture and our language that it's something I choose not to use, but that's what it is. And so we're just going to call them little meatballs. The other interesting thing it has going for it is that it uses a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't even pick out of a gut pile when they kill an animal, but that they should pick out. One is the call fat, and the another term for it is lace fat. It's like when you open an animal up, all lining the abdominal cavity is this stuff right here. If you imagine like how you use an oven bag to cook a turkey, it would have that same function. I've done hearts where I'll just take a heart out of a deer and wrap it up in layer upon layer upon layer of call fat and cook it like that, and it just drips, and it's really good. The other thing is it uses liver. This call fat and this liver are both from a whitetail from Montana that my friend Ryan shot, and he gave me the stuff to mess around with. And then we have some of just that regular ground meat mixture, so it's 90% lean, 10% pork or beef fat. What we're gonna do is make meatballs. We're gonna roll those meatballs up in call fat. And finally, it's gonna be covered in onion gravy and cooked in the oven. The gravy takes a while to cook, so I'm gonna start with that just cooking down a couple chopped onions in a pan. After about five minutes, when the onion starts to brown, add in some flour. That will act as a thickener for the sauce. Kind of keep scraping the bottom of the pan so it doesn't build up on there and burn. Then add in some stock. You use game stock that you make yourself or use beef stock. It's good if you heat that up first, like bring it to a boil before you put it in so it doesn't cool everything off and you kind of undo all the work you've done so far to get everything warm. Add in a little beer and some mixed dry herbs and keep stirring as it gradually thickens. We need to add a little more flour in there and then I'm gonna go and start to form up the meatballs. The meatballs start with a pound of our ground game meat mix and four ounces of liver chopped in a food processor. To that, add some grated onion, sage, crushed garlic, parsley, and thyme and start stirring it up. I'm gonna put breadcrumb in there in a minute, but kind of incorporate the other ingredients and get them stirred in, because once you do the breadcrumb, it gets a little bit harder to work with. Add some salt and black pepper, a touch of mustard, and wet it a little more with an egg. Then start gradually adding in the breadcrumb till the mix gets dry and doughy. This portion of it, just the meatball part, you'd use for any meatball application. It doesn't have to be for this. It's just like a, a way to make meatballs. Also, if you have another meatball recipe you really like, you could make that gravy, do the meatball recipe you like, and then pick it up with the call fat, 
I've got about as much breadcrumb in here as I can get away with. See how you can handle it almost like a ball of dough. And now I'll start forming the meatballs. Because this dish incorporates a lot of things that were traditionally very inexpensive, like chopped meat, which comes from low-grade cuts, liver, call fat. It has sort of a reputation as being a dish that was sort of a peasant food or working class food. It was popular during the war when there were meat rations and people were trying to promote the idea of eating more innards, you know, heart, liver, stuff that was cheap. So there's a dozen meatballs. And I'm gonna set these off here and start wrapping all the meatballs in call fat. Spread the call fat on a flat surface and just roll the meatballs in it and cut away the excess. You don't need more than a single layer, but make sure that they're completely wrapped. I froze call fat for short periods of time and it didn't have any real negative effect on it. It still keeps its strength. So there's 12 wrapped in call fat. There's still plenty of call fat left over and that's just one white-tailed deer right there. You could do another, you know, two dozen of those things. With the meatballs good to go, Pour the onion gravy over the top of them. To keep them from drying out in the oven, cover the pan with aluminum foil. So this will go into the oven at 350 degrees for about two hours. If you're feeling adventurous, you can try to get this thing out of here in one piece, the same way you'd pull a loaf of banana bread or like a treen. Remember how buttered that pan or greased the pan? That should kind of help. You also want to make sure to let it cool because when you let it cool, all the fat, you know, and the juices go back into the thing. So tip it and then just kind of look in there and see what you got. Yep, we got everybody fine. Lay it down like so. Cut very gently so it don't crumble. You wind up with that. It's not overcooked and you have that layer of spinach and you have the cheese in there. This actually is about the ratio of meat to vegetable that I like in life. It's not dry at all. It's nothing like a hamburger. The cheese is really nice. The pine nut has a good crunch. And this is just one of dozens of recipes that are in the forthcoming book we've been working on, The Complete Guide to Hunting, Butchering, and Cooking Wild Game. The book's coming out in two volumes. This will be found in the first volume to be published, Big Game. Like I said, just one of many great recipes that are gonna be in this book. It really is good, and it's like, meatloaf has this sort of lame, it's like a joke. It doesn't need to be as boring. It can be elevated beyond standard grandma comfort food. In recent years, there's been a strange alliance between wild game and bacon. Bacon really kind of corrupted wild game cooking. Everything you do, you just wrap it up in bacon and do bacon this and bacon that. But still, bacon tastes good. So I'm gonna show this bacon burger idea. This is an integrated bacon burger. I'm mixing 25% bacon ends with 75% game meat and then grinding it together. One of the things that gives bacon that kind of the taste you associate with is when you cook it to crispy in a pan. So it's a little bit different. The meat will still resemble bacon, but it won't be the same as when you put bacon on top of a burger. It's, it's, it's more subtle. Grind this the same way you would do any other grind. Very cold meat, very cold fat, with the grinder parts fresh out of the freezer. You can, if you got the time and the inclination, you can make burgers with nothing but a knife. Some of the meat you're grinding up comes from a mule deer that I killed in Colorado. And out in the woods, out in the field, I made some burgers just by mincing that meat. It's pretty good. It's a chunkier, grainier burger, but it's very passable. So you do not always need to have access to electricity to enjoy a burger. I'm a traditionalist in that I think that burgers should be eaten with fries. And I'm gonna show you how to make the best French fries you'll ever make in your own house. It's called like double fried French fries. And what you need to do is you need to plan ahead because you take your potatoes, cut them into french fry shapes, about like that, put them in a tub of water, and put them in your fridge overnight, like 12 hours or so. When you pull them out, 
put them into a colander, and you'll see that in the bottom of the pot where you were soaking the fries, you'll see all this white stuff, that's starch. You want to pull this, as much starch out of the potato as possible. It helps you get a nice golden brown fry. After you strain off the water, rinse them in clean water, and then pat them dry on paper towels. You want to get them really dry. You don't want a bunch of water. Then preheat your deep fryer, bring it up to 385. The thinking on the double frying is this. When you throw those cold potatoes in the oil, the oil temperature plummets. And it takes so long for the oil to get back up hot again, by then the fries have been in there too long before they start to brown. So on the first fry, you're just dropping them in for a few minutes. Once they get where they're gonna start to brown on the ends, we pull them off, strain the oil off, or just drain the oil off in paper towels, let the heat get back all the way up to 385, and then throw them in again for a few minutes. And when you throw them in that second time into the really hot oil, they bloom a beautiful golden brown. So the next thing I do is heat up a couple pans. I got a little bit of oil on the pan. These are the burgers that have the bacon in them. So these are ground in with 25% bacon. And I'm gonna do another burger here, and this is just straight up. This is the 90-10 split. This is a half pound patty. These are a little bit less. The bacon one has just a much different feel to it. And it almost takes on a different color. Like it almost gets like a cured kind of feel. A lot of guys like to put down pressure on it because it browns more of the surface. If you want to get a seared surface on there and want almost like a crispy surface. And then to keep browning it, you flip them now and then. See, we got a nice sear there. And there's a nice sear on that one. Some people say they don't like to do it because they feel that it presses out all the fat and all the juice. I don't know. I like to press it a little bit to brown it. And another thing people argue about when frying burgers is, is it OK to periodically go back and forth, or should you only do the one flip? I mean, there's some arguments we made for each. If I'm really paying attention and I want it to be right and I want to watch it and make sure I get it right, I will flip it a couple times during the process. If you have a hard time gauging how done the burger is just by touching it or looking at it. I mean, you can stick a thermometer in there. I used to do this a lot when I, I had a couple black bears I shot that I knew were trichinosis positive because I had them tested. And I got paranoid enough to start doing this all the time. And right now I can tell you this thing is still very rare. And you can kind of, you get a hang of just pressing it, what it looks like, how it holds together. I like to have them rare to medium rare. Okay, so these are both on the rear end. Plate this up. With the burgers cooked, I'm gonna hit my fries the second time. The deep fryer is back up to 385. For the second fry, you wanna watch them and don't let them burn. Just kinda of keep an eye on them, bearing in mind what the perfect french fry looks like, which is golden brown, not burnt. Okay, so those are perfect. Let them sit a second. I like to hit them with a liberal dose of salt while they're still hot. So then, you can top them off however you want. I kinda of like the very predictable burger. Lettuce, tomato, onion, ketchup, mustard. And there you have it, two variations on hamburgers. We have the one wild game with integrated bacon, grounded with bacon at 25%. And the other one, just a very standard wild game burger, deer, elk, moose, whatever, grounded with 10% pork fat. These are both crowd pleasers. And the bacon burger is a real good choice for a guest who's hesitant about eating wild game. The call fat meatballs are traditionally served with mashed potatoes and peas, so I fix some up with butter and cream while the meatballs are still baking. You can see how the call fat has gone translucent. Plate it as a simple stack. Mashed potatoes, peas, and a shiny meatball on top. And then the onion gravy. A very classic, old world, awful, intensive, kind of like old fashioned -y attractive dish right there. At this point, just looking at it, you'd never guess that call fat was there because it became kind of clear. But when you look at the meatball, you can see that it's just wrapped up in this little thing, and that's gonna hold a lot of the juice in. And it winds up having like a nice glossy appearance to it. It's very pretty. Let's see what this guy looks like when you cut it open.
That was very good. The liver is strong. It has like a, almost like a pate kind of taste to it. It's so livery. There's a lot of variability in game livers. In this particular animal, this deer had a strong taste in liver. If you don't like that liver quality, I would suggest you probably omit it from this one. Well, it's funny because this is an old traditional dish cooked in a very traditional way. And it has a traditional taste. Like it just feels like an old world kind of thing. I mean, I feel like eating this, you really feel like you're eating something that people were eating 100 years ago. Flavor profile, the texture, it's just not what you encounter in modern cuisine today. It really feels like you're taking a step back in time, and it's a nice step. So there you have it. That's great ways to use up ground meat. And late this winter, when you're digging through your freezer, and you realize that you've eaten all the backstrap and steaks and roasts and everything, and you're down to the ground meat, try to remember and try to do some new, exciting, innovative things that bring some unusual flavors and textures to your table.